I would like to call our meeting to order Tuesday, September 25th at Dover School Committee at 6.30. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, many members of the PTO and faculty. Um, first thing I'd like to do is open up for any community comments. Okay, hearing none. Move on to an update from our PTO co-presidents, and I believe Treasurer, if she's here. Yeah. Um, Amy and Hannah, Great. the floor yeah. is yours. And I think, what, what's, what are your norms? Do we stand up by uh, the, So we I think slides. we have a presentation. Yeah. Do I need to do anything to get this thing started? Probably. Probably. Um, you can, whatever you're comfortable. So okay. if you want to oh, stand okay, here. I, uh, yeah. I usually stand in. Is that normal? Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Violate your norms. Every, every month is um, different. We're very flexible. Oh yeah, good, good. Um, so this is Amy very kindly and wisely um, printed up a um, the back to school um, welcome that we had created for the parents because it gives a good summary of the activities of the the uh, PTO and. Um, while we're getting loaded here, I can just explain that one of our goals for this year is actually to kind of make invisible work visible, you know, make more transparent to the community what it is that the, the Dover PTO does, because there's so much activity actually, but it's not visible to everybody. And it's hard, and we've actually put some effort into figuring out where the hole is, you know. There are a few um, parents who've been involved for years and years who understand all the parts, but a lot of other people, it's just not transparent what, the, what it's actually doing. We also think that this will be useful for uh, accountability um, and potentially also for fundraising. And I should introduce Don Sung is here, and she is the, our fundraising um, co-chair. And you'll meet uh, me, the treasurer, in a moment. Is there anything else you want to add, Amy? No, just that um, we kind of worked hard to, and, and Hannah really worked hard to sort of break things down into four things that we are four main purposes. So, yeah. So we were. Um, so basically, yeah, we, we've kind of figured out, we're kind of making sense of this, but we basically have four functions, right? So one is around curriculum enrichment, which is really like, um, by my insight into other school systems, kind of extraordinary, the amount of curriculum enrichment that is done, that is sponsored and staffed by the PTO for Chickering. Um, so this year we have 42 different events, um, including you know the arts and hands-on science workshops and history, theater, and field trips. I mean, a whole range of experiences um, that are coordinated with the teachers and the uh, school administrators, um, including events for all grades and then also all school events. Um, and then we do a number of community events. So some of these are just like fun community events like Halloween night, but we also have things that are more substantive like a uh, science fair that gets organized every year and then also an international night which is really a remarkable event where families come and share their culture and we have um, a couple dozen or more um, countries represented every year which is uh, very impressive and it's a, a huge turnout very happy event and parents and kids everybody seems like to really enjoy the sharing it's a wonderful bonding event um, we have an MFA field trip that gets organized, et cetera. Um, and then another category of what we do is um, direct faculty support. So we've got class, we've got kind of um, a little bit of really like spending cash for all the teachers to cover some incidentals, which we actually consider really important because obviously we're all aware that some teachers are reaching into their own pockets to equip classrooms these days. But then we also have a grants program that gets coordinated with the um, head of the school where teachers or people from the, um, say, special ed department can apply for funds to make some sort of special investment in, in new technology or materials. And then, um, and then finally, we've got um, a whole series of acts of appreciation that we gain in. So when we have open house night, um, the women who were in charge of the hospitality put on a dinner for the teachers because they had to stay late. There's appreciation lunches and breakfasts and things like that. And then during Teacher Appreciation Week, we've got a, the, you are all probably familiar with the custom of decorating doors, which is a lovely um, expression of appreciation for the teachers and a lot of work, actually. <laughs> so there's a lot of um, appreciation we have to have for the PTO. And then we've just got one more slide. I'm just going to get the, uh, oh good, I can do that. Yeah. Sorry. Um, where, here, 
we just thought we would also explain um, how it is that we raise funds. And so this is kind of in order of most to least. So our biggest fundraising event is the auction, which we hold every other year. But we have some other events through which we raise funds, like Dover Days, Dawn, uh, uh, and Dina put on a Dover Days event. We raised something upwards of four thousand dollars or something like that. Actually closer to five. Closer to five. Yeah. So it's, a, it's really a non-trivial. It's a lovely community event. And then we have a Books for the Heart, which maybe you are all already familiar with. But this is a lovely way of raising. Um, uh, money for schools for the library. We have on off years, we don't have the auction, we have the check writing campaigns and, and, and we can do people, there's, we get some support for matching gifts from that. Uh, local businesses provide advertising and do some promotional stuff with us like Needham Bank and checking accounts and donations. And then we've got a few easy money things that bring in a couple thousand dollars. So we just wanted to give you, we thought that was probably useful, we hope, Absolutely. overview yeah, of what it is we do and how we raise our funds. I'm so excited to put together a calendar so you know what is yeah. happening when and just um our message this year is together we stand yeah. and we think it really works with the message that's going on district wide about everyone together and um really just how lucky we feel to be doing this and being part of this community and just the little things that Dover does and I always say we don't buy school supplies I just was struck by it this year when I was in the CBS in Wellesley and I noticed they had all these things like the school supply list and just how lucky we are that kept an organization in a school where we don't have to worry about it at the end of August, and you know how, how, what a privilege it is to work at a school like this. And yeah, yeah. It's hoping really that everyone realizes it and just bringing everyone together is that thing this year. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, you first of all, thank you for coming. I know you are presenting this to the board uh, or open meeting uh, yeah. in, in a few weeks, so we got a sneak peek. So thank you for yeah. coming in September. Um, this is great. I mean, everything you guys do, the people that you involved, all the community that offers their time and support and clearly um, money uh, where needed is awesome. And, you know, we really, really appreciate it and couldn't be able to serve our teachers and our students and everybody without your support. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a quick question. Can we ask okay. a couple of questions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you mentioned the uh, curriculum enrichment mm -hmm. and, and all the support we offer there. Do you have the ability to um, solicit feedback from the teachers on what is worked and hasn't worked, where we can maybe double down on or maybe pull back on? Absolutely. And actually, I think Gabby could probably answer that better. Please don't wait. At the end of um, every, so at any, every grade level, there's a curriculum enrichment liaison who works with the teachers to schedule. And after an event, there's a survey that goes to all of the teachers so they can provide immediate feedback. And then as the year progresses, the liaisons talk to the teachers and with the administration to make decisions about keeping programs and moving moving some of them on as, the, as time passes. Right. So one, I mean, one, this is my modest, I was the vice CE person. I think one thing that, that my, my sense of when I was in that role is we don't always get the, like we always ask and there's a formal mechanism exactly as you described. We don't always get the feedback because the teachers are very busy as like one more thing to fill out. But one of the things that we talked about is actually doing a bit of a survey and we'd love your input at some point on this to say like should we reorient so for instance should some of our money that's organized around events be dedicated to technology or something like that but i mean we're entirely open to feedback we just haven't really had there any, any formal opportunity for rethinking at a bigger level and thinking about the theme for the year or some of the core values that we're doing with our strategic plan you know if you can sort of match some of those up and how we can sort of offer support would be great that would be excellent. Yeah. yeah. If you if you have any suggestions for how to connect on that, we would. Yeah, we yeah. Can I ask this one follow-up question on the liaising? Um, how so? The, the, there's a for each grade, there's a coordinator, liaison person. How, how does FLES fit into that? Is is there a coordinator for the FLES program that goes across all grades, or is is it, 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 it any support that the um, PTO would do? To the FLES program, would that be sort of as an adjunct to each grade level? I suppose mm -hmm. that's my question. That's, that's an interesting question. Uh, we don't currently have this model tied to FLES for curriculum enrichment. Um, currently, that comes out of the FLES department, which is now three faculty members. Um, and, and they do indeed generate ideas um, for that, but that's an interesting idea that we, we can certainly explore. Mm -hmm. and international, international, like, international, yeah, language right. Which is a big piece of success. That's closely coordinated with us. Can I just ask you a question about teacher feedback? I know last year we started doing it in Google Forms. Yeah. Was that 
any, did you, was that a better way for you to get feedback from people or did you? I know, still honestly, no, trying. whether that affected the response rates, but that's a great question, and we'll ask that. Because I found it much easier to do You that. did? Oh, great. Yeah. Well, then that may be the, and you know what else that would be so nice is we can download that into spreadsheets so we could actually analyze it a lot more easily. Google, yeah. Google Forms a lot more, actually, for public CE. Yes. Really and and right. this isn't just um, curriculum management, and I don't know what happens anymore, but we used to send something home every time someone came in, mm -hmm. and we don't do that anymore. And I don't know if we can do that via balloons or something. It happens through the PTO. Oh, it does. No, yeah. but this is really important. It, I, I honestly, like my, my first, like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I think we're in our third year, but like, I I cannot get those. I mean, they do send them out, but for some whatever reason, like, they just get blocked by your security okay. on your thing. So I think a lot of people don't get them. We do. I was. So. I did it for a few years. We do right afterwards. Yeah. Do a whole summary and take right. pictures. And then it gets sent out the same day. Right, yeah, on, on the e glass. The, the technology, mm -hmm. the from monk, the chip. What is it called? Yeah, the, but the technology for curriculum enrichment right now, as we speak, is being revamped and improved. So I think we're all going to see a big difference over the next few months. And Rachel, uh, we don't see that. So yeah. I didn't know something would happen. Yeah. So it would be awesome. awesome. Okay. We'd actually, yeah. that, that we're, we're actually in conversation about how to potential, we're, it's early stages, it's all experimenting. Yeah, I know, but I but among have the brainstorm <laughs> is to. Thank God there's no other teachers here. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. But you know, that, that wouldn't be, you know, if, I don't know, if, yeah, I mean, that could be, I don't know if room parents can post on Blooms or anything like that, but if they could, that would be, it could be the responsibility of the room parents to do it, not, the, not yeah. put it on the teacher. Mm -hmm. Else? Can I add one thing? <clears throat> I, I, um, I just want to say how much I appreciate the fact that you guys have kind of embraced this, this hashtag WeRDS and are sending that message out. I wanted to talk about that in a few minutes about the importance of that. But what's key is that the, the key stakeholder groups are sending that message out as well, not just the superintendent or just the principal. It needs to continually come forward. So. Uh, I really appreciate that, and I appreciate you um, allowing me to say hello to your board last week. That was awesome. I enjoyed it. It was great. Thank and you. To remind everybody watching on TV, check writing is this year. Check writing is this year, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You look out, right? And exactly. And so one of the other things we were going to clarify is what does it mean when you give to the PTO as opposed to the DFEF, which I think people get confused by. Yeah. So yeah, we're going to try to make that more transparent. That a lot of parents have children in multiple different buildings, so yeah. you know what happens in the region versus Chickering. That's exactly. great that we yeah. make sure it's clear. Yeah. Thank great. you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thank thanks for having us. Sure. Oh yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. We can just close the screen. We'll just shut it off. Uh, I'll I'll put this on. Oh, I, more. The okay. numbers are really small, so I don't know if, uh, if you can see this going. My name is Ami Tajadi. I'm the treasurer for the PTO this year. Um, so I'm basically just gonna give numbers to what Hannah and Amy already talked about. Um, we had a very successful year last year. So our we, we budgeted to bring in 112,000, uh, brought in 127,000, largely due to the success of the auction. Uh, we we raised 11, about 12,000 more than, than budgeted um, this week, um, and that was a lot of a lot of hard work from from a core group of volunteers, and so we really appreciated all the time. Um So the big difference is that they talked about this year's a check writing year. Uh, last year we brought in 92,000. This year, hoping to bring in 30. Two, um, uh, I think there's going to be a big emphasis on participation. No matter what size gift, we we like as many people to to participate in this check writing campaign. Um, so Sorry, I mean, did you, I just want to check? I heard that right. Did you say uh, the check write the last check writing campaign brought in ninety two? No, no, no. Sorry, the auction brought in ninety two last year. The check writing campaign the year before that, so the 2016-17 year brought in uh, 30,000. Right. Yeah. Um, so I think it was budgeted to bring in 35. It brought in about 30 <coughs> with some matches. So so I think this is 32, five is realistic from uh, from two years ago, if, if that trend continues. Uh, we're still continuing the same level of programs that we had the last year. 
Um, so the curriculum enrichment, a few of the program costs have gone up. That's the difference in, in uh, here for the 42 from the third from 40. Um, fundraising expenses obviously are going to go down since we're not letting the auction. Uh, the classroom and teacher support that's still strong. There, uh, a few of the events have changed. We're not going to do the the um, Celtics family night this year, but. Uh, a few things that are, and we're also not doing the, the Meadow Farms catalog. It brought in about $4,000 two years ago. Last year it brought less than 1000 so I think it's run its course. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to, the fundraising team is looking at some other options like um, uh, all those labels. All those yeah. labels, right? Yeah, that's why we're pushing a lot more. Great, great. Um, yeah, so so that's, that's our budget in a nutshell for this year. Um, just because just I can't see the numbers, so yeah, the, 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 so the, um, the amount of money total spent in the year that just finished was how much? So we spent um, 113000 last year. And, uh, and what's the budget for the spend this coming year? We're going to spend 91000 about $92,000 this year. Um, we had a couple of capital projects that were not budgets, like the, the Chickering School sign, um, a couple of items like the, the bike rack and the shed that, that weren't budgeted that we did spend money on last year. Um, nothing, there are no capital projects budgeted for this coming year. Cool. And how much do you have in reserves? Like yeah, if, if the, if the, so when the last academic year ended, yeah. and if, 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 if let's say you, everyone said, that's it, no more PTO, right. at the end of sort of mid-June, how, how much was unclaimed and left there? So we're keeping basically a year's worth. I don't have the exact number on the top of my head. Um, I can check that for you, uh, but it's, it's around. It's a year, thousand. it's basically one year. Yeah. It depends which year. Is it is it the 120 no, it, it, one? It, yeah, we're running right about one percent of right at about hundred percent of one of our budgets. Right, right. I yeah, but but then the the auction year versus check right year. I'll have to get back to you with that, okay, cool. that number. And and the just on on that number, and Amy, we just sort of discussed this a little bit before. Um, I'd love to understand just the thinking behind the decision for the one year hundred percent of outgoings amounts. Most um, if you look at the, the academic re research for uh, the right amount for a non-profit to keep on reserves, because obviously if you keep on claim reserves, it's a little tricky because you, your, your community gives money for the money to be used, whether it's for an animal shelter or for, this, um, for a school PTO. So to keep any reserves, there needs to be a, a sort of an active reason for there to be any reserves. And um, I think the research indicates about 35 to 50 percent of an annual outgoings. So there's been a lot of yeah. I think the research is not cut and dry on that. So there. Well, I think the reason for that is that most nonprofits have none. <laughs> so so I think that most nonprofits have none. Um, uh, I don't think that's right. I, I'm sorry. I don't mean. But, uh, it um, is. So I, I, I teach nonprofits strategic management too. So I mean, right. like I'm. I'm actually, I don't know, I, I think that's not quite accurate. I mean, maybe, I maybe, maybe, maybe in the world of nonprofit organizations, but the world of nonprofit organizations, it's a weird, like nonprofit is a weird. Right, include, but like, con con conceptually, I suppose my question is just trying to understand the decision that the PTO takes on any reserves being unclaimed and there, but then also the figure of 100%, where that, we're, we're just where the thinking is. Uh, I'd be happy to share the, the thinking, but uh, I'm sorry, I just want to push back on that. I don't, I don't think we're, I don't think this is. Uh, we, there are actually some people have done some research on this, and I'd be happy to do more on norms, and we could probably even look at um, educational institutions or relative things like that. The basic idea is a is a couple. Um, one is that these is this is all the money we. This is you know what we raise is what we have to give, and our funding does vary. And it is actually declining in some respect because of changing demographics of the population. And if there is an economic slump or if there's something else, I mean, we're just relying entirely on what it is that we can raise in any year. And we don't really know how much in any year we're going to raise. 
And so the calculation very thoughtfully and with a lot of discussion was made that it would be better to have one year in reserve so that if we don't raise as much, let's say we only raise half as much money for a couple of years, we could at least put on programming, you know, that we wouldn't drop entirely dramatically the programming that we provide. We're certainly happy to explore alternative models or to think about like if the rainy day fund reaches a certain level, do we reinvest in technology or something like that? I mean, I think that would be a very that would be a very healthy conversation. But there was a very conscious, there is some degree of sense of insecurity. The fundraising is a non-trivial. I mean, it is an enormous amount of, you know, going into Dover days where we said, <laughs> oh, we raised, you know, $5,000. I mean, we had only a fraction of the volunteers that we needed signed up two days out. And there were a number of heroic events, including a mom who sat underneath the dunk bu bucket for like multiple hours. It was not a warm day. So it was not a warm day either. So, I mean, a lot of these things are, are with the auction or there's sometimes we talk about, should we experiment with a different format with the auction, but if we fool around with these things, we would have to be cutting meaningful curriculum enrichment. No, I, I think the, yeah. the, the, so the fundraising efforts are fantastic. Yeah. And it, it's to be absolutely, I mean, in awe of what you bring in. That that was not my, I, I, I think it's tremendous what we did, what, what you guys do, and what the community does as well, and how you're able to galvanize the community. I think the demographic um, pause that the community has had on for a number of years now, I think it is rebounding, but the velocity of house sales and the numbers of enrollment in the school. So I think that's, I think it's going to come roaring back in the next three or five years. Um, I, I, I would just, I would just, I would love to understand the, how that 100% sits. Um, and obviously there's a, we've had discussions with the PTO about um, the issue of sharing the repair of the surface of the playground and I know Dawn took some time to talk with Jim and Amy last year about that. Um, I'd love to perhaps make sure that dialogue is completed because um, I think from a school committee side we've been asking for some form of decision from the PTO given the size of the the reserves and um, I I, we, we'd, I we'd love to we'd, we'd, we'd love to just have a have a proper response. What so I, I think that it's hard to give. I think we've come back and said we'd be willing to help a little bit, but um, we've said a number of times. What is the you know have you gone to the town? Have you gone to DSEF? And who we we certainly are not prepared to give what's you know large amount of money. We're not, we're not a lot able to promise that. I think that's always been the response. I think also so, my I, understanding I, yeah, of this, well. so there's a couple of, uh, so we should, it sounds like there's a couple of issues. Like you would like from the school committee would like a formal accounting of our decision, like our rent, like would like some sort of statement from us about our rainy, uh, the logic of our rainy day fund. That's just my personal question. I'm not taking yeah. them off the yeah, school committee. I mean, I don't know if it's appropriate for us to have a formal accounting. I think Adrian's just curious. So, I mean, I, we don't need to go too deep on this. Um, okay. we, we really appreciate everything, obviously. And I will um, say, it's been that way since I, for 10 years since I was on the PTO. And I think it's hard when you change the leadership every two years for someone mm -hmm. to take the position that they're going to change what has been the conventional wisdom. It, True. it seems, you know, I think somewhat. I we've always had our support. We all think it'd be great yeah. to do things on the playground. You have our support as, as a, you know, group. But I don't think we've ever promised the financial support, nor do I think when we made the, did the playground in 2001, was there ever a promise that we would repay, we continue to maintain it. So I think that's where maybe the disconnect is, but I'm sure we, we could we discuss it further. Could I recommend at some point maybe we just have a regroup? Um, you know, at, at a later time, um, even with there's a couple people that have some historical knowledge on both sides and just have a discussion on what's appropriate and maybe it's ongoing um, or it's something, you know, every few years or whatever. Obviously, what's comfortable with PTO, what's comfortable with school committee administration is probably the best way to go about it. It's not something we need to boil the ocean on and we just sort of discuss what may be appropriate. So there's some expectation that may or may not be there going forward. We don't need to do this today. I don't think Absolutely. I think we want to do this Thank at a later date. Thanks, honey. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, with that, we move to the reports part of the agenda. We're starting with the principal's report with Ms. Dial. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Good to see you. 
Um, our theme this year ties in beautifully with the PTO, and I, I want to reiterate the, um, the appreciation, the incredibly deep appreciation that we all have for what you contribute to our school. It's um, it's phenomenal. It makes our community strong, and um, it would be very different place without the value of these. Thank you very much. Um, our, our theme ties in with the Together We Stand. Um, our theme this year is everyone is welcome here, everyone belongs. Uh, we're trying to make that a visible message. Uh, you may have seen the posters coming in on the front doors. Um, and we're really trying to live and breathe that. Um, last year we had very visible kindness campaigns. We had in large part demonstrating behind us. Uh, and I think everything ties it together. And uh, we're really trying to make that visible and apparent to our students as, as well as to our families. Uh, in curriculum and learning, we have our professional learning community leaders um, in more grades this year. Instead of having those leaders work across several grades, uh, we now have them in K through grade five. Um, so they will be able to have much more um, immediate contact and impact mm. with their grade levels. And they'll be working on two main priorities this year. One is a continuation of the English language arts curriculum review, uh, which is tied in with cultural responsiveness. So looking at the resources and texts we have, not only to reflect our current community, but to expand the horizons and the exposure of our students so that they have a better understanding of, of the world at large. Um, in some respects, it's, it's, it's lovely to be in um, the bubble that is Dover. Um, and in other respects, we need to make sure that our, our kids are very well informed and educated about the larger world so that they can have an impact down the road. Uh, our PLUS program is now um, in all grades, K through five. And for those of you who were there at the very beginning, such as uh, Dr. Tori, it's a very exciting year. Um, to know that we are uh, fully embedded across the whole school. Uh, we now have a full FLES department. We have um, two and a half FTE Spanish teachers. It's a strong team, um, and we're just delighted that we're at this stage. And I want to thank all of you, as well as all the people along the way who helped us get to this point. Um, you know, as with any new curriculum, there are some challenges along the way, and I feel like everyone held fast to the initial um, purpose mm -hmm. of the program, um, to the time invested, and we continue to have other districts visit us to look at our program, and they are always amazed at the amount of time we can dedicate to this and, and the results. Um, so we're very excited about that. We are getting ready to notify the public about our preschool enrollment for the coming for next year. Uh, so that is well underway. Um, in terms of professional development, uh, tomorrow we have a half day uh, in which we will receive an updated security training. Um, so we, uh, we feel prepared for that and, and ready to move on to the next stage. Um, in terms of professional growth and evaluation, uh, we recently revisited our, our goals and expectations as we do every year, um, and those will be um, developed in the coming weeks. Um, in terms of plant facilities, um, we've had discussions here in this committee about the, the trail behind the school. We're thrilled that that is in. I think we're, we're uh, still awaiting the name plates at the, at the trailheads, uh, but that is in, and Deb and I walked it together a couple weeks ago, and it's, it's lovely. Absolutely. So we hope the community will take advantage of that as well. And I think that covers the, the highlights. Um, do you have any questions? Up to you guys first. Any questions, comments? I just wanted to give a little plug for the new um, special ed team chairs. I had I had reached out to my son's teacher this week, and she responded back to me like within an hour, and then an hour later. Laura Driscoll called me, and then five minutes later, I got an email with, it just was amazing. Mm -hmm. So well, thank you for the I thought that, I mean, I couldn't believe it, how fast everyone was on it. So I would love to pass that on. Yeah, please do. I was, it was awesome. <laughs> You want to think? 
Oh, no, I know there's something. Over so I got, I, I got to speak up. Um, <laughs> it might cover me. <laughs> so I, I was um, the the line, the brilliant line talking about understanding our differences addresses as need, and the the work this year will address it more globally. I'd love to understand. Just pull that thread a little bit. And is there anything you can um, share just with a couple of specifics? It, it just seemed it just seemed exciting, and I want to hear more about it. Well, a, a couple of years ago, Understanding Our Differences, um, which for those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, looks at um, different profiles of, of people in general. Um, so whether people may have a learning disability or a physical disability, it's helping our children understand what that means for the individual, what that means for us as um, peers and colleagues, in terms of understanding them better and understanding what's what's different and what's similar. Um, and that used to live just within grade two. And we decided that, that it needed much more weight, um, much more um, importance. So we spread it across the different grades and we tried to match up um, what could be best understood at a certain grade level with a certain disability. So for example, in kindergarten, it's the focus is on allergies. Kids can understand that in the upper grades and some cognitive development areas. Um, with the work that we're doing on cultural responsiveness, uh, we want to expand that. So some of that will come through our discussions as professional learning communities. Um, and we really want to embed that throughout our curriculum, throughout our units. Um, this year it will largely be uh, a focus on kind of tangible items in terms of the resources that we use and the instruction time for that. Uh, and looking a couple of years ahead, um, we want to think more deeply about what that looks like uh, and, and beyond what's obvious and kind of typically talked about. That's great. That's great. And then I also, just reading the next paragraph, when I, I suddenly just talking about cultural responsiveness and understanding our differences. And then the FLESS program, and it struck me that that's actually one of the largest amounts of time dedicated to understanding differences and different cultures is the fact that we offer Spanish every grade, which I thought was great. Um, and then a question just from the last, the tuition rates for the um, for the school you're doing, when do we do that? So we'll do it before your budget, so either at your October meeting or I'll bring them forward at the December meeting in conjunction with the budget. We've gotten into where we're doing annual increases yeah. um, so that we can keep on keep on track. So. Thank you. I, so we talk a lot about cultural responsiveness and cultural proficiency lately in a lot of, a lot of different venues. I think it might be confusing to parents um, that think about culture just as country of origin culture. Mm -hmm. And when we're meaning so much more than that, I have these conversations a lot and I think we might be potentially losing parents who think that that's just a very narrow uh, definition. When we're talking about physical differences, learning differences, socioeconomic differences, et cetera. So I don't know if we can broaden, uh, help people understand how much broader that term is than just mm -hmm. typical what you think of as culture. Right. I think I, when we first started having these conversations a few years ago, I made that mistake. And if, if I'm so in, involved in making that mistake, then I think that presumably other parents are, are not getting that. So. I, I think that's an excellent point, and, and we do need to talk about it much more. Um, you know, internally, we've seen how that has evolved in our in our conversations and our understanding. And uh, I think you know, everyone has has their starting point yeah. in terms of how they look at that and how they embrace it. Um, so we do need to have a lot more conversations and a lot more communication about it. I think. I think you're spot on. Can, can, I, you. yeah. can I also respond to that? Yes. <clears throat> so when we first started talking about um, the hashtag we are DS, the, the rationale was to say to the greater community, every single kid has to feel as if he or she matters and is valued equally in this system. Because if they don't, then those kids start to very quickly figure out mm, why bother I'm not a smart kid, I'm not an honors kid, I'm not a great athlete, I, um, I'm Asian, I'm African American, whatever that is that makes them feel in some way different is a big problem. So the cultural proficiency is teaching us about what 
you know, how do we become culturally proficient so that we don't, for example, make assumptions about students with special needs? Could a student with special needs be on the honor roll? Could a student with special needs take AP classes? Believe me, there are people who don't realize that of course they can, but they might be on an IEP. So what we're trying really to do is continually pound both messages that this hashtag we are DS is how we're speaking to cultural proficiency because we're forcing ourselves as a system and especially the teachers, but this is something that we are continually bringing up and raising that question. That's why I was so glad to see that. <clears throat> we're continually reminding ourselves it's much more than just about race mm -hmm. or gender or ethnicity. It's about the big picture because we know we have populations of kids who actually sometimes struggle with that. They actually feel as if they're not part of DS or they don't belong to the degree that we would like them to. In fact, to that end, the high school through the NEASC process to get accredited has to look in the mirror and do a self-study. And in that process, they have self-identified. This is huge. This is a big, big thing because they figured it out themselves without us having to tell them this. The teachers and the administrators sat around the table and looked, combed through data and said, you know what? We have to do something about this sense of belonging. It's important. We do have some kids who feel like they belong and everything's great, but then we have some who, even if it's a small number, that's a problem. They've got to feel like they belong. They've got to report when we survey them that they belong. This is actually how you lift achievement in a school. You don't just keep pounding the kids who are high achievers. You find those kids who have become disenfranchised, those kids who feel like they're not ever going to be successful or they're never going to be considered smart and therefore they're, they're not going to be the great ones. We have to reach those kids and, and let them know that we actually believe that every single one of us has the potential to achieve at high levels. So the cultural proficiency really feeds the hashtag we are DS, which feeds this idea that every single kid belongs, which feeds this uh, concept that all kids can achieve at high levels. So it's really connected. And that I have an article that I want to share with you guys about this building a strong school, school culture, because one of the things it talks about is the leader continually pounding that message ad nauseum. <laughs> I so if, if I could, I, I, I love that it's being, that message is being reinforced at, at each of the schools that I'm involved with. And I think it is being reinforced. Um, I kind of echoing a little bit of what, what you're saying, Brooke, I think that, that sometimes the, the, the nomenclature that we're using can maybe get a little, get the message a little bit diffused. Um, I mean, one of the other things I love, and I was going to mention it, um, a little bit later, but I'll mention it now, uh, is, you know, you have the, the, um, uh, the core values, you know, on the letterhead. Um, that, I think, should be front and center in every one of our schools, in every one of our letterheads, uh, and that should, that should be primary. Um, I love Together We Stand. I love everyone is welcome here, everyone belongs. But if there are a number of different mottos or or expressions of core values or what are we doing this is do, does the message get a little bit diffused rather than having the core values and the we are DS tied to that um, to have that kind of consistency from you know K through 12 uh, that is is that a, a more efficient way of, of, of driving that message home day in and day out, you know, including posted at the schools. I, I, and that's a, that's a struggle I've always had, <clears throat> certainly as a superintendent, because every school feels its own personal identity. So it's really tough for a new superintendent to come in and say, are those values that you settled upon 10 years ago or whatever they were? they're actually secondary to the district values. So it's hard to do that. It's not that it's not possible, uh, but it, it's, it's hard because you, as a new person, it's pretty tough to come in and say, these are the core values we've identified based on what you've told us. 
And then they say, yeah, well, these are our core values. So we don't, it is a, it is a challenge. I think in the perfect world, Michael, yes, we would all have the same core values in each school and the district's core values would be those core values. Um, I think what's a second alternative to that is that the school can still have its core values as long as they support the district's core values. The KISS can't be wildly different. Which they do here. They, so they, sh they do. Absolutely so those are do. really yeah. consistent with it. But I, I think what we're really talking about is the, the messaging and the communication. Mm -hmm. So in my newsletter, which is <laughs> supposed to come out next week, so that's a goal of mine, but for the district, the first thing I want to write about is this whole idea, because to clarify for people, so the message for me is consistent. And also we have an evening event planned, just to uh, say it quickly, an evening event planned on um, October, November. sorry, November 8th. I wrote it down. <laughs> now I can't find it. November 8th at 6.30 in the middle school um, music room, choral room. And uh, that is going to really be focused on these kinds of conversations about what's next for DS and all of these things and how they tie together. So hopefully to clarify, I agree, it, it is confusing, but just like when you're in school and you're hearing all this new information, mm -hmm. it's like, I, I don't know, but then it does come together. Mm -hmm. The key is that we continually say the, the same messaging. Laura and Deb continue the same messaging. Renee continues the same messaging. The key stakeholders continue the PTO with the same messaging, and it does start mm -hmm. to take hold. But I truly believe to to drive the culture of a school in a certain direction it takes multiple years. <clears throat> and if this if this is a priority for us, which I've heard it is, then it's going to take us some time. We'll just keep on pounding it. Can I just one small thing, just pulling on what Michael and Brooke were saying, and Andrew, what you said. The um, making sure every child feels um, valued and, and, and feel that they they too can participate in in all that the schools here offer. It's something that this committee has talked about in the last 18 months, and I'm just just I know in the next coming weeks the budgets will be built and for, for the next year. But it's something we talked about about using um, being bold and and using aids in the way in the best way possible at those key age, key ages that you told us about where if if a child is sitting there feeling perhaps they're not uh, able to do math or english as as fast as some of the other kids that that what one of the key ways to help them you said is is at certain grades having aids being able to do small group work mm -hmm. and i just uh, it just seemed to sort of fit what we were talking about just now when when people look at building the budget, both from the building perspective, from the central office and from your perspective, because you all have relationships with the stakeholders in the town, I would just um, encourage that topic that we've talked about in this committee to be please have it as forefront as one of the weapons that we can use to try and help those kids. Mm -hmm. And that is actually um, at, at your October meeting, we ask you to provide that kind of information so yeah. we have it before we build the budget. Um, have your vision and things that we can incorporate. Yeah, I was always trying I to will make notes, but you're, you're ahead of me. <laughs> yeah, because there was some, when we get to the enrollment, there's some grades that are mm -hmm. getting up there. Okay. okay. Sorry, thank you. Yeah. Any other comments? Talk too much. Oh. Yes, please. Um, I've heard, a, 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 well, for the last several years, a lot about uh, health and well being of, uh, of students, and there's a lot of work done with that. Uh, are there initiatives in place for the second piece of that, which is health and well-being of staff? Um, they're evolving. Um, we know that it is incredibly important, and seeing the changes in education, um, there is a strain on, on educators for sure. Um, there are different pieces that are evolving, um, and we are trying to find out from educators you know what is needed what is what is helpful um, so I don't feel like I, I can give um, a well-defined answer to your question um, but I will say that we know that it's it's really important and I think right now we're seeing it in little pockets so I think I'm referring to this Brady back here um, you know she applied for a DSEF grant last year 
to hold a book group, but I think for people to have those conversations about, you know, what are, what are they seeing with their students? How are they responding to that? Um, gaining ideas from each other. That's one way um, that, you know, through, the, through those discussions, um, we're helping people. Several years ago, we decided to give up half of our uh, staff meetings to our professional learning communities. Um, so that's not all administrator-led. Now there's certain things that we just have to share out, um, but we're trying to create more opportunities for discussion um, because we also know that you know to be happy and healthy in your environment, you have to make sure that you're you're contributing and that you're being heard. Um, so trying to create more and more venues for that, um, but it's it's definitely something that um, is in process. Thanks. Um, yeah, but just that. the book group, it's, um, it's not um, Judy Pequot or anybody like that, it, but it's like the Happiness Project is one of the books that we're going to read. Um, another one is Option B. Um, so they're books that have more of a like a psychological kind of um, aspect to it that you can then bring to your life and then hopefully bring to your kids. Um, Anne Cuddy is another one about presence and mm -hmm. bringing yourself into a moment. So they're a little mindy, but um, I think it'll be a good time for us to talk about things, but also build a little bit of a community too. And a lot of the professional development requests that, that we receive um, that teachers are applying for um, through different universities in the area and, and different collaboratives, um, many of them for the last couple of years have been around mindfulness about um, how educators can support themselves in the work that they're doing with students. Um, so by providing funding for educators to tap into that resource is, is another really important way that, that we can address wellness. So thank you for that. So it's a really good question. And it's and you know we're we have a lot of goals. And so we'll talk about that on the twenty third. Hopefully we'll have time, but we have a lot of goals in that action plan, and some of those speak directly to how we can support faculty. But sometimes it's not even in the big things, Michael. Sometimes it's in the little things, like when we had the slideshow at the beginning of the year and asked people to submit their slides, and they just laughed and enjoyed each other's pictures. They really just kind of cherished the moment. And that builds a sense of connectedness and just for a moment, everyone was just enjoying it. In fact, you were there, so I had to I had to stop myself because I really wanted mm -hmm. to, to cut it off and get get down to work. But you'd also heard the faculty before applaud in response to that goal. You know, that was the first time they'd collectively heard it, and so it's clearly a priority for teachers. So, but we're not we're not well out of the gates. We still have plenty to do in that regard, and we can talk more about that when we hit the action plan, I would say. Great. I would just to add a couple things, and um, some of it's been mentioned, but I think it's important to reinforce it. Um, someone told me repetition is the mother of success. So, um, you know, Laura, you mentioned in your um, sort of review, in, when you're talking about the professional learning um, community, you literally highlighted two of the strategic goals, the strategic objectives, mm -hmm. which I think is great. You know, you mentioned how they touch on innovation, uh, teaching and learning, as well as health and well-being of students and staff. I think the more that we, you can do that, and anyone who does this in any of their reports to us, to highlight what we're doing that it touch or affect or are impacted by the five um, strategic objectives, it reminds us, it reminds everybody who happens to be paying attention, um, and it's just really important. So I would just reiterate what we've talked about for a few minutes. The more we can remind each other what we're doing, whether it's PTO or any group that touches on these objectives, I think is important. Um, I also, it's n through no small task, five years of the FLESS program. Um, I mean, it's students are involved in that, obviously. The teachers, school committee members that came before us um, and that have been through this, I mean, it was a commitment. And I think it's going to impact the middle school next year and going to the high school. And we've talked about that, but that's commendable. So that that's awesome. So everyone that's been involved um, needs to get credit for that. 
And then lastly, um, I think it's also important to a successful launch of the school year, right? So um, that was also a lot of effort by people that were working in the summer, making sure schedules are appropriate, making sure the classrooms are set up as people coming in early. Um, so the teachers do that. And I know they sometimes solicit help from their previous students, which is kind of fun. Um, you know, making sure that the classroom sizes are there and everything that goes into it, um, you know, we probably don't even, couldn't even mention all of it. So I think everyone that's been involved deserves a big thank you for that one as well, so. Thank you, that's an incredible team effort. Thank you very much. That's all I have. I think we're moving on. Andrew, are you next? Or I am. It, well, so Beth is uh, unfortunately at a commitment. Um, she is. And work, helping work and move the, the district forward. Speaking to uh, strategic objective number one in the of teaching and learning. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Portrait of graduate. So if you want to maybe do yours and hers together, or people had a chance to read best in, in advance, but if they have any questions, hopefully you can at least address or get answers. So yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to uh, to be redundant. So um, I will just share that the um, well, you, you actually you've read it. So if anyone has any questions on bets, I'll do my best to to answer them, and I'll let you reflect on that for a second, and I'll do mine. Um, Again, we, we are obviously emphasizing the hashtag we are DS work. That, that uh, opening meeting is like, uh, it's like coaching. I, I always say it's like coaching the, the little kids in soccer. You have those six-year-olds, and they're running all over the place, and it's organized chaos, if you can want to call it organized. But the, for that one moment when they all come in, and you get together because you're about to start the game and everybody puts their hand in just for that one second. Was it eight and enough? Eight is enough. Remember that program? Mm -hmm. They're all in the circle and everyone's looking. It's actually a really good example of a teachable moment. I used to try and tell them, okay, we worked on this, 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 and this. This is the same idea. When we bring the teachers together, we have an opportunity to really emphasize our vision and our key points. So at our opening meeting, which was awesome, uh, Beth did a great job with a game where it worked on kind of reminding the, the teachers that we don't all come to the table with the same skills and abilities. In this case, the game was some groups had all great letters to make as many words as they possibly could, and they had tons of vowels, and then others had all these consonants at the end of the alphabet and couldn't form any. And they were like, this isn't fair. And that was the point. So, and they were getting and they won awards. They, they were getting awards for this. <laughs> so it was just a reminder of of the inequities that kids come to us with. I did something as well with them where I asked the, the teachers to share a story where a teacher had really changed their life. And every teacher has these stories. A teacher had really changed their life for the better. And um, they shared them with each other. Usually, I'll do this with new teachers, and they'll break out, and then they'll come back and say, and they always have this really compelling story, but. I also asked them to think about a time the teacher had hurt you, not necessarily physically, because that was pretty unusual, except for me in second grade, back when corporal punishment was a little more acceptable. <laughs> uh, no, but I mean, uh, where somebody had said something to, to you or just it, it just stuck with you forever. And people can remember things. They can remember the setting from 30, 40 years ago. And what I was trying to tell the teachers is you have tremendous power. So that was really, uh, we talked about the core values and the strategic goals, and uh, it was awesome having uh, Henry and Michael there to, uh, to join us when we recognized the teachers for their years of service. I included those in your packet so you can see these fine people uh, who have done so well, one of whom is sitting in the audience tonight, Renee Grady, at 20 oh, years. <laughs> want, a, want a chair up here? We, we, we will make room. <laughs> so that's just such an awesome uh, experience. I really love that part and that tradition for Dover Sherburn. Um, so uh, the other thing I wanted to, to uh, remind you of very quickly, you know that our audit, uh, our special ed review is underway, really moving along nicely, and we expect a presentation from Dorsey on the 23rd, I want to make sure I remind everyone that's at the middle school library. It, so it falls. Well, we, we start at 5.30, I'm sorry. Yes, it, it, middle, sorry, yeah. the middle school library, this Dover's committee starts at 5.30 and then the joint committee is at 7. But that's where we'll meet. Um, 
really want to thank the folks who participated in the um, search for the interim special ed director, Debbie Dixon, who will be joining us on Monday. So we're really excited about that. It's a lot of downtime. <laughs> yeah, she she, she, retirement. she, she, <laughs> she, she, fit, she retires on Friday and starts on Monday. <laughs> so uh, she gets a whole weekend. She won't get used to it though. Um, we did get some good information on the waiver, the critical shortage waiver, which we do not need to apply for for oh. this fall. So that was good news. Uh, we will apply in the winter. Okay. Uh, but that's uh, that's a, a kind of a load off of everyone's minds, uh, and uh, um, I think that pretty much covers it. I mentioned that we'll have the strategic plan action plan presentation on the 23rd as well. I do want to congratulate the teachers and the students of this school system from Dover, from Sherburn, and all the way up because Dover Sherburn did receive that impressive ranking of number one in Boston Magazine. That's always, uh, it was for Dover Sherburn High School. No credit for Chickering, Pine Hill, or the middle school. That was last year. <laughs> was it? Yeah. Okay. They alternate so, years, the district and high school, district and high school. It, last year was the district. It is a big deal. And I hear about it all the time. And I, I, um, I don't want it to make, I don't want to make it our focal point because I think that's a big mistake. I really do. I want us to continue to focus on the goals that we've set forth. We don't have a goal that says be the best uh, uh, school in Boston Magazine. That is not a goal for the system. But at the same time, I'm torn because I feel like you do have to acknowledge the hard work of these teachers and kids. So I want to uh, do that. And then again, as you did, Henry, thank um, Laura and Deb and uh, Stephen Honorado and Ralph Kelly and all the people who did so much work, Don Fattori all the work that goes into getting this school up and running for the start of the year. It's, it's impressive, so thanks to all of them. Do have a coffee Thursday at 8 a.m. That was not in my report, but for any parents in the audience at home, come to the coffee Thursday morning, 8.30 at uh, Chickering in the CAF. Anything for Andrew? I have a few. Please go. <laughs> um, the special ed director search would be kicking off what around beginning of the year? Question um, of the Monday, calendar year. Monday. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right, right about the turn of the year, I would say. Marshmallow project. Yeah, marshmallow project. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I should have gone and knocked them all out. <laughs> the you should really. Um, I know should, two times, and that's why I was trying to look at uh, You, you should, had me a marshmallow. You, so. you, should, you should check out the marshmallow. We did that at the leadership retreat. <laughs> the, the leadership team broke them into groups and gave them this challenge. And basically, it was about um, collaboration. And essentially, you get um, 11 strands of spaghetti and a certain length of, of string and a certain amount of tape and a marshmallow. And the objective of the, the competition is to see who can build the highest structure with the marshmallow on top that doesn't fall over. And so, and no extra supports. And um, I don't remember what the tallest one was. I was on the winning team. You were on the winning team? <laughs> <laughs> Don't so, give it away. Technology and being at the no it was technology it. accounting we right. So see, we're competitive too. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. this is in our DNA. So it was a lot of fun. But if you watch, there's a great TED talk on it, and it's really about how kids, little kids, kindergartners, are so uninhibited that they they just trial and error everything and quickly without you know feelings getting hurt. Whereas executives. Mm -hmm. um, do really poorly. <laughs> so um, it's really worth checking out. It's a lot of fun. We contemplated doing that instead of that other game at the start of the year, but we just we just felt like it was going to be too much. Too much. That time. other game was great, and that was really well executed. It was, it was uh, Beth did a great job. Really, yeah, really well done. Um, third question: augmented reality. I don't know if you can speak to that or I, I should wait and ask Beth about Aug that. Augmented reality, I believe, is the Google. Um, the VR? The, yes, I think so. Am I right about that? Yeah. Yeah. So you Google, uh, not just Google, but um, different companies, uh, you can uh, essentially look through the lenses. And it, it's, 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 it's a phone, but it's a 3D vision. So you can um, look at, as if you're flying over the pyramids or in a jungle in a 3D setting. It's really kind of neat. And, and um, companies will come out, I know Google does this, I don't know who else does it, 
because I went to Pine Hill, did a whole day. They did yeah. a whole day. So the kids come in, they, they experiment with them. It's it's a really neat uh, use of technology. And um, I'm sure that's that was in Beth's report. Yeah. I'm sure that's what she was referring to. And did we do that at uh, Chickering? We, we have um, kits that are shared between Chickering and Pine Hill and the middle school, intentionally shared and um, supported through a grant so that we build a little excitement around um, the rotations that they make to the schools. Uh, Steve Hart shared a little demo on his phone. He saw a demo at Pine Hill and Google came here as well. And uh, to me, it reminded me of uh, looking at a hologram using glasses. Mm -hmm. I think it's at the, at the early stages, um, but I can certainly see the benefit, especially in an area like science, mm -hmm. uh, where we might not have something actually on site uh, but could project something and, and really do a lot of exploration that doesn't involve the kind of equipment that I've seen um, marketed in the last 10 years. I have to say I was a little disappointed when I first used them because I was anticipating something like the holodeck on the Starship Enterprise. <laughs> <laughs> no, not quite. It's, it's pretty much a, That's next year. It's pretty much the 3D visual. It's not really uh, interactive. Can I just say it for now? I checked my calendar. The coffee's at 8.45, I believe, on Thursday. I'm sorry. So, 8.45? Well, okay. I don't know. Not before I, Thursday. Probably. I must have put that in my calendar so that I would be yeah, early. Yeah, yeah. And, or, 8, if anyone else here is planning to go. 8.30 for me, exactly. 8.45 <laughs> is fine. 8.45 yep. on my email. Perfect. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Good catch. That's right. Anything else? Thank you. Well, now that Michael stole the marshmallow project, I guess we're all going to be quiet now. <laughs> I also, um, Henry, I should say, uh, because I, I don't see it anywhere else on here, is that I included that enrollment report. So that um, that does give you a snapshot of where our enrollments are. Um, yeah. And you can see, so we're up four students from last year. We are um, one over, sorry, we are quite a few over. Our, projected, our projection. Our projection was that we would uh, be at 473. Well, that's the one-year projection. Our three-year projections were just up one. So if you take the three-year growth, we would uh, we were projecting 478. So we're at 479. Right. Um, so that's we're right in the. It's good. So I think the growth models that we're using. Remember when we look at your class sizes, we did the one year, the three year, and then somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. Well, we ended up really, really at the three year. Because so. the three year really takes into consideration those kind of odd fluctuations. Exactly. So this one year projection was for this fall, not for next fall. No, that, that for this year. For this is what years. when you did when we did our budget last year, that year. was the one year okay. projection for fiscal year 19 okay. enrollment. Mm -hmm. So you, yes, as uh, Brooke pointed out, um, you know our range is 17 to 22, in, by policy, and uh, in the fourth grade, it's it's close. Is the strategic learning center still happening? Uh, that is not um, not there this year, uh, and it has to do with enrollment. Uh, being okay. in one school district, um, sometimes we have you know populations that that move through the grades. Yeah. Um, however, we have um, kept the position in the budget, I believe, so that if, if the need resurfaces, okay. um, that, that we can bring that back. Okay. Thank Is you. Is that accurate, Don? Yes, right. We, right. we made that decision after budget, so it's in this year's budget, and we'll talk about where we go <coughs> when we talk about fiscal year 20. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Don, I believe you might be next. So just quickly, you have your um, report of approved warrants. It's a little bit longer this time since we have had the summer that's passed, um, but that shows you. And just for to refresh your memory, it's the date we sent it to town hall, the amount, and the uh, the comment next on the last column is what um, type of warrant it was out of district of general or what, going to one of your grants, et cetera. So that gives you a, a little bit of an idea. So, um, and thank you, Rachel, and all the people who covered this summer for signing the warrants. Um, just know that um, it is time sensitive because Dover does hold the checks on the AP warrants until the signatures are um, acquired. So always just keep that in the mind. The summer we were a little behind, 
and they were holding those checks, which then affects our vendors. So I don't even get the emails anymore, though. So well, do that's they go primarily probably, to you? Yeah. So if away? Rachel can't do it, I think she looks out for you. Okay. Um, and just so you know, too, we've had a change. Um, so um, you've. You've, I, I think I've crossed the communication path with you that Barbara Barrett now mm -hmm. is your new contact yeah. um, as Janice retired um, this summer. So um, she will be reaching out and then yeah. just always know that you need to just reach out to someone yeah. um, if you can't do it. But we'll have one going this week. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, moving on to your um, fiscal year 18 closeout. Um, I think it's a really rosy picture. Um, I won't have a lot to say. Everything basically came in about what we talked about all year. You had a small positive variance in salaries, a little bit larger variance in operating expenditures based on um, the legal reserves, which that was the leftover, right, from the, uh, what we put aside for the contracts. Uh, again, we had a very favorable oil pricing last year, so that gave us a nice surplus. And we really didn't encounter any major building repairs last year, so we had a surplus in building maintenance. Um, so we had about a $100,000 surplus for just our operating expenditures. On the flip side, for out of district, um, we ran a little bit of a negative variance, close to about $100,000. Uh, it was a lot of activity, although I, I mentioned to you that our budget for fiscal year 18 provided for 37 placements. We ended up with 38. But um, as you see each year, when I show you the budget, there is a lot of fluctuation in there. Mm -hmm. So that sort of tells you the story, but not the whole story. Um, we'll, we'll share more when we build the budget for fiscal year 20. Uh, but about um, 88000 of that was tuition and about $6,000 was transportation cost. With that all rolled together, though, and the... Um, uh, the receipt of Circuit Breaker, you are returning back to the town a million seventy-five thousand dollars. Um, so you've got a little bit of a surplus from operations of forty thousand plus a hundred percent of Circuit Breaker. Mm -hmm. So on your statement now, what um, I've done because I always was confused by this, I left all your numbers gross, and at the bottom I've shown you your Circuit Breaker because I think that tells a better picture because yeah, really um, then it was really confusing when I would show you the June or that we used to show us the June and there was these huge surpluses mm -hmm. and you couldn't understand it. So I've left your numbers whole, um, but just so you know, on the town side, we send over an entry to take all that money out of our school account and put it against the circuit breaker. So I think they were trying to um, mimic the town's books, but these are a better reflection for you guys. Um, and then as um, we've been doing on a quarterly <coughs> basis, you have your um, statement of special revenue and revolving funds. Uh, so we're showing your building fund. You see the circuit breaker goes in and out. Um, food services is continuing to build upon their fund balance. If you remember a couple years ago, we were actually in the negative. Mm -hmm. So we're slowly building, which is great. This is a really small program, so it's actually sort of hard to build a fund balance. So it's nice that we have sort of built up 40000 As we start needing to repair things in the kitchen, this is another source for us to be able to pull versus having to ask the town. So it's sort of why we, we keep that moving. Um, we don't use it on a regular basis because we're sort of building a little capital reserve uh, for the kitchen. Dawn, do you know, is, is that a is that indicative of a higher percentage of participation? Yes. So across yeah. all the schools, we're seeing an uptick, about 2% increase in oh, participation. And then if you remember, uh, two years ago, we increased the lunch prices. Yeah. That also has definitely um, helped build a little bit of the um, fund balance. It's probably time for us again. I think one of the strategic uh, goals that I'll be working with is looking at our revenues, both rental fees, but probably other fees. It's probably time to just look at the lunch pricing again, um, because as we know, the cost of everything is going up. Uh, and so it's probably prudent upon us to just um, make sure we look at our lunch price and see where we stand. Did we ever standardize the building rental we talked about? No, that's what we're, we'll be doing. So I anticipate in your uh, your January joint meeting that we'll roll out, our goal is to roll out new pricing for all the facilities um, and standardize it a little bit um, more across the district and, and try to um, reap a little bit more mm -hmm. of revenue from that. We're, we really have, we're, we're very, um, uh, kind to the users of the group, but we just have to make sure we're at least covering our costs and using it as a source of revenue to improve our buildings. 
And in preschool, we had really cut our fund balance close the previous year. Um, so we were able to bring ourselves a little bit. We don't really want to keep a large preschool revolving fund, but that's there for some special things that they need. If you remember the very first year, we took the whole fund balance and put it towards the playground. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to have a little bit of um, a nest egg too. It also helps us when um, if unexpected things happen in the general fund, it gives us another place to be able to look if it's pre-K related. Any questions on 18? What's the Student Activity Fund? I'm sorry. So the Student Activity Fund is run by the office here at the school, and it's all your field trips, uh, um, any, I don't know if you buy these summer books, what goes through, but it's mainly your field trips um, so that they'll collect the money, pay for the venues, pay for the busing. So it's just a, a revolving mm -hmm. fund for student activities. That if you remember, I think last year, that is audited. Um, and so I did present, I think, their audited report to this group. We still have a couple of findings we have to address. It's predominantly around um, the district's policy manual right now addresses the middle school and high school student activities, but not the two elementaries. So I've, I've sort of put it on the policy subcommittee that we need to incorporate into our district policies, policies for the elementary student activities, because we keep getting written up that we don't have those. Um, they're taking a closer look at student activities because that is a, a an avenue for, right? Yes, exactly. So they've they've sort of um, taken a hard look at that. In fact, for the first time, the the region's um, activity accounts are finally getting audited. Mm. So, don't the after hearing um, from the PTO how, how they are organizing a lot, very many field trips, the the ones that run through here is it the the end of year fifth grade. One All the ones when they go to Plymouth Plant, you still go to Plymouth Plantation. Um, Plymouth, that was yeah. Such yeah. Fun. yeah. Plymouth was fun. I love yeah. that. <laughs> so it's anything for the that's in the it's anything that happens during the day in the school yeah. goes through student activities. Yeah. What about actually? This, I'm just going to interject. What happened with the f uh, fifth grade? I don't think are they going anywhere at this point. Mm -hmm. That has shifted. <coughs> yep, the fifth graders will spend two days at Hale Reservation. They did that again? And the 31st this year, we went to the fall. Okay. To try to unload June a little bit. Oh, they do it in the fall? Yep, we're trying it in the fall this year. Okay. And June was. So does the seventh grade. I don't know if she spent We're also using it as a team building activity rather than a, mm -hmm. um, a close to the school year. Okay. Um, so giving it a, a slightly uh, different purpose, which I think will be helpful. Yeah. And I was going to ask about the air conditioning. We love it. Is it, is it functioning? <laughs> it's great in my room. Kids wear jackets to school now. Yeah, my kids are summer. freezing. <laughs> they love it. They're like, they love it. on those 90 <laughs> degree days, they were packing sweatshirts. They're like, our rooms are freezing. I'm like, I called Adrian. I'm like, you're going to be so happy. My kids are freezing. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I do want you to know that um, everyone truly appreciates it and the novelty has not worn off. Mm -hmm. so people comment on it on mm -hmm. a regular basis. <laughs> students well, it was another opening of like school that we definitely needed it. So. That was fun. Yeah. Sure. yeah. 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 So thank you. So much better. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Yeah. yeah. And plans for the gym with the cafeteria? So um, not the gym, but the cafeteria. We always talked about when we replace your main compressor that does the administrative offices and some of those other rooms that we would look at to expand that to include the cafeteria. And do you remember when that was on the... So that's in 2022, I believe. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> cool. A couple other questions yeah. from 18. Yeah. Um, I, I was I was a little bit saddened to see that that the school committee was was off by what the third fourth largest percentage uh, over budget and um, I don't know I don't know what we're consuming <laughs> but what is it yeah so what that was really? the um, the security audit okay got um, it. and so any little so we didn't quite have enough to cover and I think you might have had some other um, something else that, that uh, you had. So we, we don't, we build in there, like it's your fees for MASC, to be part of MASC is a big chunk of that. Or it um, was the uh, health, in, health insurance? Not, um, that didn't hit um, Dover. Didn't hit Dover. No, that was just So it was probably primarily the, 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 the audit security audit, yeah. Put things over. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, and transportation, my, my recollection is that that was also a um, kind of consistently over budget so in reduced. 17 as well. Is that Was that right or no? Yeah, so that what we build in is a fuel adjustment surcharge into the transportation budget. Yeah. Um, and in the past couple of years, we've actually gotten credits because the fuel price was so low. At the end of last year, we actually started getting the fuel again. surcharges again. Um, but I'd also reduced that surplus, and I've been reducing it a little bit because it was a big number. So at all the schools, I've reduced it a little bit um, because it was going the other way. So that'll that'll so get built we in might this be, coming year. Yeah, I mean, yeah. with gas, we probably will definitely again. get a surcharge um, this year, so we'll use a little bit more of that. So that's a safety net for the fuel surcharge. Thanks. I've got one last small question. Um, is it quite soon that we'll be able to tell um, the net benefit of the school's LED retrofitting plus yeah, so, an air conditioning um, system, how that nets off? Yeah, that is on my list um, to look at that. And remember, it's um, we needed to get past some of the fall months yeah, no, to have I, I it up because of the air conditioning. Yep. So <laughs> we did LED lights and we added air conditioning. So we were really going to compare like the October, once we air, air conditioning wasn't being used anymore, I used the October and November okay, months. So sort of end of the year, January yeah. we'll hear. Something. Yeah, okay, yeah. Great. So we'll, we'll definitely um, look at that to see. Um, and we've act, they've, uh, they had to come in and do, um, do some replacements because we did have some <coughs> defective. Um, the last time I was sitting in here, I think it was the last time in June, I noticed a lot of lights were out. So we got them back in here and there were some defective things that they came right back in and fix for us, so um, that was good. So on that, so um, the update about fiscal year 19 capital has been on everyone's agenda, as you guys didn't have any fiscal year 19 capital, if you remember, because this place was swarming <laughs> last summer between every light being touched and the air conditioning being installed. So we made a strategic decision. One, there wasn't any capital projects that were in dire need of being done, and two, the building staff just needed a little bit of a break so they could get caught up with the craziness that was happening the year before. Um, and it, we, it was fortunate that we didn't have anything that needed to be done, but that really allowed them to sort of get back and do the building basics and not have to worry about working around all the electricians and plumbers and, and such that were here last year. And I think that really worked out well because one of our uh, main custodians on a, a medical leave all summer. So that was actually perfect um, that we didn't have a lot going on. Looking ahead um, for your first statement next month for budget to actual, we have had some post um, uh, budget staffing changes. You've had, obviously you see Mrs. Chase isn't here anymore. Um, the um, One of our classroom teachers retired. So there will be some positive salary variances, obviously, when we you know, uh, show you your first statement. Um, and, but other than that, everything else appears to be in line, what's coming in, textbooks and such, where we look like we're, we'll be fine. Uh, we'll see some salary um, variances. And we're also um, looking at um, getting together with Audrey to sort of sit down and look at all the out of districts at both locations. So, I'm sensing that um, we're fine in Dover. I don't think that there's going to be any unexpected. We should be close to where we were uh, for budget, um, but we'll report that to you also in October. Um, the other thing we'll talk about in October is we'll have a draft of your fiscal year 20 um, in five years out capital. Great. Um, there are some paving on there, so I want to talk to the town about if that kind of paving, it's the access road, the emergency access road and the walkways. We've got a really good working relationship with the town now, so I'm going to see if that's something that they'll just want to pick up in their annual paving or if it's something that we should still cover in ours. Um, we also had a big technology project on for fiscal year 20, which in discussions with Mr. Ritako, he thinks that's probably not going to be necessary. So your capital that we thought, is, it might be quickly dwindling, so I'm going to look out and see what we have and maybe move some things forward so that right. we can separate that out. So I'll get the building group, which is you two in, right, um, uh, probably a, a day or two before your October meeting and just go over it with you. I've already told the town will be um, that you'll submit it like on October 24th after you approve your first draft. That's about uh, two weeks or about a week 
um, past their re required deadline of October 12th, but we do that on an annual basis. They've already been notified, so they're fine with it. Um, and we will then work on, continue to work on that plan from October until January, even into February and March, um, as we work with you guys and the committee. But um, everything, everything looks good. From this perspective, did anyone have any other questions about 19 or? Just a great point on that access road and clarifying with the town. Remember, we've had in previous years realizations that actually the town, oh, it's their responsibility for a couple of things, and that's a great, great yes. conversation. Yes, we pulled, so we pulled a lot of the paving off, but for some yep. reason, I'm I'm trying to remember why we didn't pull the, yep. that piece off. So we'll great. check into that. And they're just getting their committee together. So until this week, they didn't have a chair for me to reach out to. So uh, that's why it's been a little bit delayed. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Great job. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, great. Well, thank you. Uh, I mean, great job in 18. The fact that you're saying you are negative $94,000 on a, what, a $3 million out of district budget, which for my math is like a third of a percent, mm -hmm. is like, I'll take that miss any day. <laughs> to call it that is, you know, not even doing it justice. So, yeah. fantastic job. Million seventy two and change going back to the town. Mm -hmm. um, that's great. So we're lucky to have you. We're lucky to have everyone that pays attention to <coughs> these things. And um, looking forward to seeing what's going on for 19 and how we can move that along and potentially put some money where other causes are needed. But exactly. Thank great. you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, next item on the agenda is our consent agenda. Uh, approval of the minutes from June 18th. Any review? Anything notice? Mm -hmm. Hearing none. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes from the June 18th, 2018 uh, meeting? So moved. Second. Second. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. Great. Thank you. Uh, for. Uh, communications uh, in your packet. You've had a chance to look at the calendar. Obviously, we're trying to make it as clean as possible. There's been some adjustments, so thank you for being flexible for those of you that have to make some changes or move calendars around. Um, assignments are there. Um, I actually printed them. I actually have them in my notebook now, so if I need to quickly fill out my assignments, I can see where I'm supposed to be. But if there's anything that we need to adjust, let me know, but that should be good. And then there's minutes from the regional and the school committee meetings from earlier in June. Any other items open for discussion? Hearing none, we are going to adjourn um, at 7.51, enter into executive session, not to return back into open session after that. Thank you. Thank you.